those who there's our recording notification. Uh, those who are in the audience, if you don't like being recorded, you can always put your turn off your video and uh, remain in the in the room and, and, and listen and participate still. Uh, and those of you who are not speaking, if you could mute, mute your own uh, audio, that would be great. Uh, good afternoon and welcome to today's episode of the Marin Poetry Center's 2021 virtual traveling show featuring Christina Waters, Dale Jensen, Judy Wells, Deborah Beckles Schmidt, Dottie Lemieux, and Margaret Wagner. I'm your host, Dave Setter, MPC's social media director. MPC gives thanks to the members who make these events possible. If you're not a member, please consider joining us and help us build bridges through poetry. Details can be found at marinpoetrycenter.org. Also find on our website details about upcoming episodes of the virtual traveling show and other events. For this afternoon's event, chat will be open where our readers' bios will be posted and where you may leave appreciative comments. Chat can be found at the bottom of the Zoom screen. MPC begins today's event by acknowledging we are located on the unceded ancestral lands of the Coast Miwok people of present day Marin County. We honor with gratitude the land itself and its ancestors past, present, and emerging. With that said, let's begin the reading. First up will be Christina Waters. Welcome, Christina. Thank you, Dave. And thank you to the Marin Poetry Center for inviting me. Um, I have a, about five short pieces to read. And the first one I'll start with is called Waiting Room. I will wait for heaven's gate to open and rain down spooked deers, though I would prefer cats. I will wait for my memory to defrost and locate the name of that Syrah we used to chug. I will wait for my dream to tune in sharp and show me where my passport hides, elusive as the Dead Sea at high tide. I will wait for Mr. Right and grab the Mr. Wrongs along the way, like enemy forces showing up at dawn to tunnel through my thighs. I will wait only as long as a poodle waits while the coyotes cross the trail, sniffing for rabbits missed by the great horned owl, whose long glides through the night remind me not to wait to pawn my garnets, not to wait and miss my mark, not to wait till he returns. I will wait until the beauty of this terror sinks into my skin, a semi-permeable membrane to the mind of God and all his mistakes, nutshells scattered by blue jays, so greedy they cannot fly. Okay. <laughs> this one is called, The Things I Didn't Miss. Because the daffodils were thundering up through the earth and loudly proclaiming the spring, I forgot the things I didn't miss about him. Looking for what I feared to find, I forgot how much I hated his hands. The stubby fingers etched with tobacco, yellowed with loss. The noise of the paper narcissus, the wisteria thrashing into bloom, the hyacinths straining to avoid the gophers, all distracted me from his habits of laughter, fantasy baseball, cheap tacos, harp lager, burgundy sweatpants, and an encyclopedic memory for every song David Bowie ever wrote. The thunder of April long past the acacias, long past the IRS liens on my paychecks, the sibling suicides, the refusal to wear adult shoes, the devotion to Hawaiian shirts, 
there was so much I couldn't forget that I never remembered the good times. Now the things that I hated are all that remain of the man I never married, despite the cigarettes and stars. I tried to tell him, but he'd already gone, like tulips splayed open in the warm afternoon, dropping petals on the carpet of a wasted life. But God, could he dance. <clears throat> You'll detect a theme, by the way. <laughs> this one's called Name Dropping. I should have been embarrassed the next morning when I forgot his name. I called him Scott and his name was Stan. I picked him up in a biker bar in Sacramento. He seemed like a fairly clean cut guy, the man who would become my second husband. How could I have known back then as the cheap metal sounds of ACDC filled the background? How could I have known that he considered Khalil Gibran, a great poet, and Gurdjieff, a great philosopher. How could I have known that he'd only read two books by the aforementioned Gibran and Gurdjieff, and not all the way through? How could I have known that he only wanted to smoke weed, that he liked tending houseplants, that he'd been a champion skier, that he'd max out my credit cards buying Nikons, and that he would be there for me when my sister died. And that he never minded that I called him Scott when his name was Stan. Thank you. <clears throat> this one's called Size matters. It used to be bigger, didn't it? When I was a kid, it was huge, bigger than the Grand Canyon. And it was filled with everything I wanted. Ice cream for dinner, long chiffon dresses in pale shades of aqua and rose, exotic jungles shrieking with unmade di discoveries mountains that would be named after me, operas I would write, oceans in which I would swim for hours and hours, sunsets that turned very slowly from tangerine to aubergine until there was nothing left but that mood indigo that forms the backdrop for a sprinkling of stars. I remember those stars, they still show up even though the years ahead are no longer quite so, so, you know, infinite. But that's just how it is, the future. It ain't what it used to be. Okay. Okay, I have to retrieve the poem I just accidentally <laughs> dumped. And I'll finish up with this one. It's called Burning Question in the Denny's Parking Lot, 2 p.m. last Friday. If I become a poet, will I get a big butt? All that sitting without moving, without getting up, and straining for the right word, like the French say, le mot juste, and catching only compost of other people's minds. My brain hurts from stabbing in the dark for words that slice like steel, like fire, like star-spangled sex, and breaking down on outworn images and recycled trash. The spread is real. My glutes grow soft. And is it really worth it just to get a date with Ellen Bass? Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Thank you, Christine. I see uh, many, many appreciative comments in the chat. Uh, and, uh, you know, those greedy Blue Jays are going to stick on my mind for a while. Uh, you know, and the biker bars and the Denny's, you know, all, all places we're familiar with. So thank you for shedding new light on those places. You're welcome. Yeah, well, next up will be Dale Jensen. Dale, take it away. Little details, unmute, unmute. Okay, um, I'm going to do several short ones, starting out with things from books. First two are from amateur mythology. The Haunt. There, in the pane of the back window, you see its face. Bug-eyed, tongue bit, that would scream if it could move itself out of the glass. It's been stuck there, you think probably for decades now, but it's only now, early middle age, that you see it. Its implied breath takes the real breath out of you, but it doesn't really seem to breathe. It's a child's face, the face that was yours when you lived in a house with a backyard window like this one. You keep imagining the rhythms of its breath or its hands or life below the top of its shoulders and soon it becomes familiar, then flies away. Three newspaper pieces. Yeah. We've got a guitar solo back here, if you can hear the phone. Uh, your newspaper grows wings and flies of its own knowledge, but flies only so far. Newspapers left in the rain grow eyes, learn to ask stray dogs the time of day. We have all been newspapers. The sensation ends when you see your successor the next day preening in new ink. And one from Unark. My ripped shirt. A herd of crabgrass, an elephant snake sneeze, a philosophy of parthenogenesis from the collected giggle in your pocket, a collusion of laundromats that the sneeze not be narrow, that its path be epic and tropical, that the word laugh be named specifically as law, and that your satchel be not named chicken soup. No, murinated Montebank minnesinger, imaginary amphibian hitchhiker, entanglements of the liberty of roadmaps, open decanter of the dilemma of mixed certainties, let me sneeze as cosmically as I want. Log, fossil, cremation, blue star, octopus, telegraph, jibber jabber, conflagration of hot workbench sweat, Sunset lawn chair, lawn chair of mouse and rat torsos, trepidation of false furs at the counter of dime store truth, hilarious explosion of tea kettles at the last word of the Gettysburg Address, the crown princess ruffles at the furthest edge of her dynasty's solar system. These petroglyphs are written in English ants swimming in fossilized water. You've been singing them since babyhood. My ripped shirt is having an anxiety attack. Flags wave wildest when wildflowered apes are waving them into their armpits and declaring it everybody's national holiday as fireworks invent themselves out of sawdust and castle towers spurt glory open mouthed. Excitement and lust are mere curves on your roadmap, their voice beyond idiocy, their truth beyond believing. And three more. 
a lot of the things that I do are cut up uh, in the William Burroughs, Brian Geisen tradition. And um, cut up writing, you get a text or a recording and you do things to it. You juxtapose lines, you tear pages apart uh, and put them back together differently. Um, you do things to them and they come out differently, um, not necessarily grammatically, but there's a meaning in there. This was cut up from some stuff that I wrote um, when I was 23 and I cut it up this year. The Gremlin's Feet. Don't know who is keeps doing that summertime. All hazelnuts off vacation. Somewhere in the clock turns purple when the second hand rounds 65. What a kingly way to come home. The gremlin has feet like a chicken. Off work now. And it gets cold here at the North Pole. He leans against a lamppost, his hands in his pockets. And whatever it is that's across the street shines against the cool diamonds of the blacktop. Someone, years later, is sneaking up behind him with a dark alley. The dust rises and sinks like the whole world is breathing. Its inhales and exhales seem like they come from a century ago. Things regular the way you think they were then, so that in that way believe that order is kept tomorrow. He's still under the street lamp. If it were warmer and clearer, he'd be flipping a coin. The watchman watches him from someone else's ego, then watches the sky, older now, wishes for clouds. This next one um, is caught up at the infraverbal level. Uh, the words are cut up and put back together in sequence so that there are different words or things like words. And the title gives away what it was about originally and sort of is still about bus weight. Ickens am usuf alki go vert off eb us top atty can see rough awe in dow. As is it he, air aiding cartoons. Theb us we lap pair, ick now them in doff theb, us to ol li cando. Say eme no what eb, oots top hebu top ak rost. Hest, reet, alicad, o, is uh, it. And this one was written obviously this year, uh, and it's a little more conventional. Vaccine. When the virus had worn itself into history, the wolf emerged from his hiding place and bought a trinket from the kid down the street. Someone had used chalk to make a picture of paradise on the sidewalk. The artist next door dressed for summer. Summer was something the wolf had thought had gone away forever, eaten by a microbe even smaller than a snowflake. But here it was, summer or something like it without even any cold winds. The wolf didn't need cold winds. This must be a dream after all that the virus had done to the world the last year. If the wolf were asleep, he'd have to turn over. But when he tried to turn over, all he could do was spin. People thought he was dancing and started to dance too. Soon someone was playing music and the whole world thought it was happy. The wolf was happy too. Vaccine. He didn't even think of cows or of lambs for dinner. And that's it. Thank you. Hey, thank you.
Thank you, Dale. Dale, you took me to a new dimension with your cut-ups. Boy, I'll tell you. I think I'm going to be dreaming about some of those word combinations. Okay, am I sure to go this way? Well, next up we have Judy Wells. Judy, are you ready? Take the stage. Hi, everybody. Um, good to be here with the Marin Traveling Show. Thanks, Dave, and the text and my friends here in the audience. Um, I'm going to read from my two latest books. Um, this is um, The Glass Ship, and I'll read from that first. Uh, it's about, um, it's, it's loosely based on Irish, uh, medieval Irish voyage tales. That, um, and there's usually a sea captain who sails out on a boat and encounters all these strange experiences and, and fantastic uh, um, I islands. And the captain is usually a man. So my captain is a woman sailing by herself in a small skin boat, boat which the Irish call a cura. So this is the um, title poem, The Glass Ship. I saw it far out on the horizon, a blinding light. As it came closer, I realized it was a magnificent sailing ship made completely of glass. Glass sails, mast, hull, a dazzling spectacle in the sun. At times the glass ship reflected rainbow lights like a crystal. I had heard stories of this legendary ship though no one I knew had ever seen it, but here it was bearing down on me in my small boat. I looked up at the now looming ship and spotted a young man and woman on the deck dressed completely in white. They were dancing whirling slowly, waltzing to be exact. I saw one face, then another, and was astonished to recognize my own parents. A longing arose in me and I called out to them. They stopped and looked down at me curiously. My father with his slicked back hair, my mother with her black curly bob and did not seem to recognize their daughter. They resumed their positions, whirling around the glass deck, a whirl of white transfixed only by each other. Gradually, I realized why they did not recognize me. I had not yet been born. Here were my parents, deeply in love, before they were married, before the four children began to come, before the toil of creating a home. The glass ship sailed off with my dancing parents. Its wake caused a slight rocking of my small skin boat before I was left alone on the still sea. And uh, this is one of the islands uh, she first encounters. It's called Red Sea, Red Island. It was not wine dark nor scarlet, but rather a watery pale red, the sea I sailed to Red Island. When I stepped ashore, I thought I had to be ready for combat. I was wrong. All I found was an island of elegant red Irish setters who lapped my hand with their pink tongues, scarlet cardinals with punk hairdos and black eyes and seas of swarming red ants. Curiously, the ants did not sting me. Instead, they were intent on building large towers out of red sand. They did not seem to live in them. I discerned these red ants were artists building for aesthetic pleasure. As I wandered further inland, followed by the great pack of red Irish setters, I came upon a huge garden of red roses. They seem to be crying, exuding red dew from their exquisite petals. I bent towards one large rose 
and thought I heard a voice say, we were once human, all of us. Now we are flowers. We die in a day. If you want to save yourself from our fate, race toward the apple tree and eat. I wildly looked around and saw a small compact tree just outside the huge garden of roses. I picked the shiniest red apple from the heaviest bough and sunk my teeth into its flesh. A tingling sensation rushed over my body and I glanced down at my bare forearm. Silky red hairs were pushing from my flesh everywhere. I raced toward my boat, hastily jumped in and watched the, pa the pack of Irish setters howling on the shore as red retreating waves carried my boat out to sea. She has many more adventures after that. Lots of adventures, my female Odysseus. Um, I'm going to read two poems from my latest book, Dear Phoebe, the Dickinson Sisters Go West. Phoebe is my uh, great grandmother who came out to California in 1864. And um, within two months of stepping off the boat, she was supposed to become a school teacher. She got married and moved to a Walnut Creek, California with her, um, with her newly met husband. <laughs> this one is called Phoebe's Combs for my cousin, Webb Johnson. Cousin Webb, you tell me this tale without a trace of horror without guile, like the eight-year-old child you once were in 1947, when you witness the workers bring bulldozers up the hill, then put on rubber gloves to dig up the 30-year-old grave in Walnut Creek of our great-grandmother, Phoebe Dickinson Webb. The shovels hit the fragile wooden casket with a thud, broke it open, and there lay Phoebe's skull. You saw her fluff of hair, two combs still fastened to her skull to hold it back. Can I have the combs, you asked the workman? No, no, no. They carefully put her bones in a box and put her name on it. Webb. You were the only family at the Walnut Creek Ranch gravesite. The curious child who watched the disinterment ordered by a superior court judge. So real estate developers who wanted that prime piece of land, a small hill with a magnificent view of Mount Diablo, who wanted that Phelous Cemetery with its 35 graves of New England pioneers to create a new housing subdivision genteelly called Arlene Gardens. Two combs for a housing development. It wasn't much to ask for a souvenir of our great grandmother, Phoebe Dickinson Webb, but the answer still came, no. Webb, your reward came years later. You unearthed an old trunk your father had saved when he too had to move from the family home on the old wed property, so a freeway could roar through old Walnut Creek. In the steamer trunk, you found a cache of letters from the 1860s addressed to Phoebe. You spent a year transcribing these letters. And now we know much more about Phoebe, her family and her times than mere tortoise shell combs could ever tell. And that, that cache of letters forms um, the base, much of the basis of my book. And one, one last one, um, a little more cheerful here, but on returning Phoebe's 100 years overdue library book. Friday, January 13th, 2017. Dear Phoebe, I just wanted to tell you, great grandmother, that you became famous for 15 minutes today 
100 years after you died, though your name was misspelled P-H-O-E-B-E -E, instead of P-H-E-B-E -E, as it should be. Your great-grandson, Webb Johnson, found in your old trunk a library book you checked out a century ago in 1917 in San Francisco and decided to return it. You see, the San Francisco libraries had an amnesty on returning overdue library books without a fine. Yours would have been $3,650 at 10 cents a day. Oh, I know that's outrageous, Phoebe, but it's inflation. Dear Phoebe, you died before you could return your book. So my cousin Webb and I took it to the Park Branch Library in the 8 Ashbury. We expected a solid handshake and perhaps a snapshot for our saintliness, but no, we were greeted by a barrage of ABCT cameras and reporters from the San Francisco Chronicle to broadcast the extraordinary news that a 100 years overdue library book was being returned at last. The head of the San Francisco Public Libraries handled the book like a rare relic. I wanted to check it out again. As soon as Webb returned it, he had cooked up that plot. I had even applied and received a psychedelic library card from the Haight-Ashbury Library, but the library head said I'd have to wait. Was this precious jewel intended for the library museum? I guess its title, 40 Minutes Late and Other Stories. Thank you. Thank you so much, Judy. You know, we were talking beforehand about our inability to travel. So thank you so much, especially for taking us along on the glass ship. Greatly appreciated journey. Next up in our reading lineup will be Deborah Beckles Schmidt. Deborah, are you ready to read us your poems? Yes, thank you so much. I really appreciate the opportunity to read today and I've been enjoying the poem so much. Like so many of you, I have been very preoccupied by the wildfires. We have a little cabin right below Yuba Pass. And in fact, this is the first summer that we have not gone up there in, in many years because the air quality is just outrageous right now from nearby fires. This poem was written at the cabin last year. Dry lightning. Oh, California, where are you burning? From the cabin porch, I search the horizon through haze and trees, the deck rails I stained only yesterday with their cutout pattern of swallows in flight, glow orange in this strange amber light. How will we know if we need to go? What can we save? What will be lost? How many others are caught in the urgency of these choices? Where do the flames hunger and seethe? Where do the deer run for their lives as the great firs ignite and fall? How many fires must the land withstand before we find our way? Oh, California, where are you burning? And this one is called Dreams of Water. The bare clay of the trail contracts and splits under unforgiving sun. Wild oak husks, trembling, empty, point north like pale pennants. Only the buckeye is still green, but its once lush blossoms have dried to a whisper. When the sear wind blows, we hold our breaths. And I dream of water of stretching my bare arms, palms upward into a fine falling mist, of standing chest deep on the edge of the Pacific and being lifted off my feet by a rolling wave, celadon, luminous as sea glass, cool and silken on my skin. 
My husband and I love to listen to Peter Thompson's radio show, Bluegrass Signal. And for the last two weeks, he has been doing what I think of as his rain dance, playing one song about rain after another. So this is my rain dance. The next three poems I think of as my thunderstorm trilogy based on memories of New Mexico where I grew up. Corn dance. The stone polished red clay pot holds a sprig of incense cedar. <clears throat> Brittle rusty needles still exhaling resinous sweetness. One breath and I am back under the ramada of pine boughs, right behind the male chorus, my breastbone vibrating to their low voices. Hundreds of dancers circle the bowl of the plaza, deepening the hollow worn by generations before them, lifting their knees with each pulse of the drum until through the soles of my feet, I feel the heartbeat of the earth. A small boy offers me a branch of incense cedar gathered from the mountains this morning at dawn. His father says, take this and bless your home. We dance for rain and for renewal. We pray for everyone and for all the earth. Inhaling again, I remember how the next day the clouds opened and we drove through the thunder shower to the laundromat where some of the dancers had brought their ceremonial clothing. They spoke softly to one another, quiet brown hands smoothing the applique, bright shirts swaying from the racks above the basket carts. I knew then that the same gods who placed the stars and loosed the rain must sometimes come to the riverbank to wash their clothes. This one is called, thank you. This one is called Arroyo Seco Thunderstorm. The air was charged with the pure pungency of ozone and so much latent electricity that the down rose on my arms. A deep muted growl carried from the far horizon. To the west in Navajo country, the slant of rain linked roiling clouds to the waiting land. I watched for lightning, silent golden flickers threading the thunderheads. The first great drops fell warm on my skin, cratering the dust, filling the air with the richness of new slaked earth. The storm crescendoed, surrounding me, the lash of lightning suddenly fierce enough to spook me, thunder roaring in its wake, raindrops chasing me through the sage, up the steps, into the house. Inside, the downpour became a drumming on the metal roof, the light subdued, cloud shadowed, and still I remember how my mother turned laughing from the open window auburn hair backlit, and how electric with the storm's energy, her skirt a swirl of blue, she reached for my wet hands and whirled me around the room. Thank you. This one is called Halcyon Days. It's written for the belted kingfisher, Mega Cyrilly Halcyon. Alcyone, the wind god's daughter, grieving for her beloved husband, threw herself into the sea and was changed by her father mid-descent into a kingfisher. Afterward, every winter for seven days around the solstice, while she brooded on her floating nest, Aeolus calmed the Mediterranean. These were the halcyon days. Our time in Taos was just such a calm, bracketed by two storms, the lightning, thunder, and flash floods that swept us into New Mexico, and the soul-searing storm of divorce that drove us wounded and weary back to California. But in between, for seven years of my childhood, we were held by the blue crescent of the Sangre de Cristo Mountains. 
and in the heart of that crescent was Twining Canyon, where Columbine flamed in the aspen glades, the Rio Hondo danced glinting over the stones, and the crested kingfisher flew downstream, lapis wings lit with water droplets, dipping and rising in his flight as if weaving together river and sky. And I will leave you with a little bit of balm for a summer evening. This one is based on true events in the life of cellist Beatrice Harrison about a hundred years ago. It's called The Cellist and the Nightingale for Beatrice Harrison, 1923. One May evening at foil riding, she brought her cello into the garden. The air was balmy on her moist skin and the mossy stone bench still held the last of the day's heat. This was the season when nightingales returned to the English woods, but none had been heard here for years. As she began the chant and do, spinning its soulful chromatic lines into the twilight, another song rose from the silvered shadows, the song of a lone nightingale. Pausing between flurries, the unseen birds seemed to listen and then respond releasing coloratura trills, whistles, and warbles, often matching her pitch and sometimes gravitating to harmony. A creature so wild and free would die if we were caged, flying again and again against the bars, compelled to answer the bone deep call of migration. Yet he seemed drawn to the gentle discipline of her music the scaffolding of phrasing and tonality, pushing and playing against it like Bach's right hand, a descant to her cantus, or a jazz flutist riffing over her dusky melody while she moved beyond all consciousness of her long rigorous training, beyond the voices of mentors and critics, becoming with the nightingale, what she had always yearned to be, another singer in the garden. Thank you so much, everyone. Great, thank you, Deborah. I was, you had me neck deep in those water poems. I enjoyed that full immersion. Boy, we need thoughts, of, thoughts and prayers of, of water. Two readers left. Next up, we have Dottie Lemieux. Dottie, are you there? Are you ready? Take, I'm here. Take it away. <laughs> Am I ready? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Can you uh, hear me? All right. Um, this first poem is uh, in the anthology, the M MPC anthology for this year. And it is um, called Elaine. And it is about Elaine. And Elaine is here today. So Elaine. No one has to tell her Henry Miller makes better reading than the Boston Globe. No one has to tell her she was born too late for beatnik desires. These things we learn together, calling it identity crisis. Born under the same sign, we are 22 years old. Friends. When I'm not feeling well, she reads me Ferlinghetti over the phone, buys me coffee without sugar. And sometimes at bus stops in winter, we hug each other like victorious Russians. In spring, we go to the river. We go there to be disappointed and disappointed we come home. Elaine makes tea and omelets and we read poetry to jazz records from the library. Sometimes there's wine. Then we dress up in turtleneck sweaters Elaine closes the curtains to shut the traffic out, and we dance. There are no calendars in Elaine's house, and no five o'clock man to stop us. And this next one is um, from my book, my chapbook, my latest chapbook called Henceforth, I Ask Not Good Fortune from Finishing Line Press. And you can buy it from finishinglinepress.com. 
bookshop.com or uh, bookshop.org slash shop slash MPC and the money that you spend there will go to local bookstores. You can pick it up at your local bookstore. Um, this is a little love poem in a prose in a prose format. It's called The Toothbrushes Are Kissing. On the ledge under the bathroom mirror, like they are passing each other in the hall, like two lovers working different shifts, one coming home, the other going, clocks set by different alarms, by night and by day, by car and by bus. They meet on the landing, careful not to wake the children, get the dog riled up. What's the weather? How's the traffic? See you at breakfast? They pass and draw one to the other, bristles stiffening, reaching out and whisking by, barely touching, an air kiss like they might be French, then back again like they might be magnets. They never let go until torn apart by rough human hands, one from one. Molecules move between them, spreading DNA. Human hosts scrub, scrub, scrub the night away, exchanging grunts, shake and rinse clean enough, replace in separate holders, backs turned, lights out. And this next one is um, another prosy prose poem. Um, and it's from a series I'm putting together called I Remember. And it's a little snippet sort of memoir-esque of things I actually do remember. I remember being a child at my grandmother's house in Methuen and my aunt Irene telling my mother about someone where she worked who got fired for not working hard enough. I remember her saying, she got called into the boss's office and he fired her right there. And I could see the woman in her nice office dress suddenly going up in flames. And I was so shocked that I didn't even think to ask why my aunt, usually such a kind person, didn't rush over and put out the fire, or why this is what they did to people who didn't work hard enough. I didn't find out what getting fired really meant until years later. I never thought to ask. I just knew I never wanted to work in an office because what if I didn't work hard enough and got fired? This next one, I remember as a kid, one of my favorite meals was called Marguerite's meatballs. It was something like Swedish meatballs, and maybe that's what it really was, but I didn't know there was such a thing as Swedish meatballs, only Marguerite's, which I loved. Marguerite was my mother's best friend, but we never met her. All I knew was that she and my mom had known each other for a very long time, and she had invented this meatball dish. One day, I answer the phone, and it's the mysterious Marguerite of the meatballs. I know it's her because she asked for my mom and says she's a very old friend and hasn't talked to her in a long time. And does she still make the meatballs? If she says her name, I don't hear it, but I know that's who it is, mostly because of the meatballs. So I call my mom to the phone saying in my excited voice, mom, it's Marguerite. And she and Marguerite talked for a very long time. When she hangs up the phone on its hook in the wall, she turns to me and says in a voice like a whisper, her name isn't Marguerite at all, it's Margaret. We never hear from Marguerite again, but we still eat her meatballs regularly and we still call them Marguerite's meatballs and they are still delicious. And this one is um, a short poem from a collection of pandemic poems. I'm hoping to get published. <laughs> now this, it's been published actually this one, but I'm trying to put them together. Anyway, this is called Six Feet. The length of my dog's leash, meeting another 12 feet between wary humans, dog sniff nose to nose longing. How, how tall my father was, or so he said, but you couldn't always trust everything he said. Ask mom. 
The width of a cell in San Quentin prison, not counting men stacked in bunks, stale air, no phone call, no defense. The distance between two not yet lovers, masked strangers, no touch, but eyes, no hands, no mouths, alone together. The depth of the average grave, except in genocides, war and pandemics like this one, where you have to share, don't die. The width of my queen size mattress, enough for two most nights. Sometimes I want it all for myself. Tonight you stay. And I have one more that was in the Berlin um, poetry anthology from last year. And it's also about my mother. It's called Lucky. Lucky that my mother takes quick flight, her bones lighter than air, free from a heart full of angry clots and memory. Lucky for her, lucky for me, avoiding decisions, arguments with a sister who might have other ideas. What to do with the mother's shell, with the mother still inside, tethered in white, tubed and bound down in bed, unaware or too aware or somewhere in between. Lucky her shell holds only ashes, agreement and relief. Her rainbow soul aloft as we wave her on, toast her spirit with food of her ancestor gods, tart resiny wine, shiny black olives, tangy Greek cheese. Thank you. Great, thank you, Dottie. So many, so many fine lines, but you had me at hug each other like victorious Russians. You had me from, <laughs> the, from the start. Thank you so much. Well, last but not least to bring us home on this reading here, uh, we have Margaret Wagner. Margaret, take the stage. Thank you so much. And thank you to the Marin Poetry Center. Uh, it's always such a delight to participate in the traveling show and everything that you offer the community. And thank you to my fellow poets because this was quite a rich and creative afternoon. So this is my first poem, Altar in a Barn, dedicated to a cowgirl. Torn ticket to a rodeo, stained. Upside down, wooden raspberry basket. Teal, brocaded pin cushion, the size of a child's hand. Dried bee balm bouquet. Well-worn lasso, shredded and dusty. Rusted Campbell's soup can, brimming with marbles. Baby booty, scuffed, eyelets misplaced. A black silk stocking, lace on its ankle, draped over rosewood branches, crossed to the four winds. Silver, butterfly charm with busted clasp. Hotel key, yoked to a plastic diamond shield, letters faded. Metal watering can with no handle. Yellow coneflower sprouted from a crack in the soil. The marks N, O, W in the dirt. Gray t-shirt with gold smiley face hung over a hook. Empty bottle, Jack Daniels, label scratched off. Thanks. So when I was a, a young girl, a little girl, young, much younger girl, uh, my parents and I, we would all go to the Presbyterian church, and I actually hated to get up when all the kids had to get up and go to Sunday school. Uh, I hated even more being in Sunday school, and they kind of made a competition out of memorizing the books of the Bible and all of this, and I just felt it was a little boring. So I uh, thought about my 10-year-old self in... Uh, in this poem. Girl 
memorizing Apostles' Creed on her 10th birthday. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. I believe in God, Jesus Christ too, plus Mary, Mary, how does your garden grow? I believe, I believe, I believe in fire engines, Smurfs, and Malibu Barbie. They created heaven and earth somehow. Who's God's father? Who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. Daddy says mommy's not a virgin. Lordy, 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 mommy says when she stubs her toe. We suffer under Pilate, like Amelia Earhart, and that Joni Mitchell song, clouds, clouds, crowds. If crowds hadn't gotten in the way, would Jesus still be here? He descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven. Arose over a three-day weekend, like a merry-go-round. Do roses go to heaven? Who wears the crown of thorns? When do we go to hell? What's hell? Jesus rose again like Wonder Woman and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. God sat on my right hand, and when he flew away, I held a red balloon. God came to judge. We came to confess. Holy moly guacamole. What does holy mean? I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints. Mother says she won't offer an olive branch anymore. Is that a sin? Is daily bread everlasting? Why will the world end? When is it time for glory, hallelujah? The forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. I believe in spirit. That's my guinea pig's name. When the saints go marching to communion, reassure the ghosts. Casper's my favorite. And please forgive our church. Amen. Thank you. Ah. So one of the, uh, the greatest uh, disappointments or sadnesses I had about turning off my fountains uh, for the drought in California was that the birds ceased to appear. But while I still had the water on, they definitely gave me a lot of uh, pleasure, things to think about, especially the crow. So this is called Crow at the Fountain. Crow swigged water from my fountain, spoke raucous, head cocked sideways, preening in the budbler, dripping water like beads off a broken rosary. Jumped to the wood rail, crisscrossed that rail three times with its beak. Looked at me through the window was Crow curious for connection? Was Crow my birth father or the dad who raised me come to visit? Propping half a bagel on the rail, breakfast stolen from a gardener. Bagel balanced like the wooden lifeboat my birth father rode on the Jersey shore. Rocking in the shallow surf, stuck in sand. Crow flew from rail to tree out of sight. Crow's beak open evoked my adopted dad's next to last breath. Inhaling wide from calm to awe to fear to terror. What did he inhale from the other side? My dad who paid for my schooling sat beside me for my first drive, showed me a J stroke on the canoe. Does spirit leave the body with a push from the chest bone, 
like light pressure of spindly bird feet. I walked with my dad on a country road, scared by a sound. A bear, I exclaimed. A bullfrog, said my dad, the exceptional Eagle Scout. What was that frog doing so far from pond or stream? When I hear the boing, boing, boing of the bubbler in my home at night with blinds drawn, I know crow's been near with a hop back into the fountain for baptism, mouth agape, panting at the glory of God. Thank you. And Dave, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Margaret, for that slice of American life from the cowgirls to Bible study to crows. You covered a lot of territory there. Well, we've reached the end of our reading. Thank you so much again to our readers, Christina, Dale, Judy, Deborah, Dottie, Margaret. We appreciate you being members. We appreciate you participating and make this, making this traveling show come alive on the virtual format this year. Hopefully we'll all be able to join each other in person next year. The next episode of the virtual traveling show will take place Sunday, August 8th, 3 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, if you'd like, take one last glance at the chat and uh, see what your fellow audience members thought of these fantastic poets. Join us again for another virtual traveling show or another one of our events and check out everything going on at the Marin Poetry Center at marinpoetrycenter.org. Until then, wishing you great poetry, good health, and please enjoy your summer. Thank you on behalf of Marin Poetry Center.